Hello everyone and welcome back to the Drock Show. Today is going to be the first of what I hope is a pretty long series where I'm going to be going through my literal favorite story of all time with the person who I can credit for my love of storytelling. Do you want to introduce yourself and how do you want to be referred to? Hi, I'm Rosanna Jackson. I'm Lyndon's mom. I'm a teacher. Um, I teach everything from philosophy and First Nations to theater and English. We are talking about One Piece up from the beginning of the first arc, which is called Romance Dawn, all the way up to the end of the Baratie arc. So that's uh, Romance Dawn, Orange Town, Syrup Village, and Baratie. And I want to say I'm going to be trying to, as much as possible, not talk about spoilers, not talk about what to expect, and let you experience everything as much uninfluenced by knowledge of the future as possible. I appreciate that because we also had a talk where you were telling me there's something in the future that apparently is going to be (laughs) very, very sad. And you wanted to know whether or not I wanted a heads up when I was getting close to it or not. Yeah, it's not for a while, but uh, I know you overall, this is an uplifting series about hope. There are a couple moments that are kind of brutal, and I know in general you're the type of person that likes to look up what to expect. Yeah, I find that it's helpful with my anxiety if ahead of time I know that I'm coming into something. Like if if a dog dies in the movie, I need to know and I need to prepare myself or just avoid the movie at all costs. But I can't avoid uh, the dark moments in here, so I don't know. I'm going to wait see what people think, whether or not I should be warned or whether I should just let it hit me. I'll say, like, I'm mixed on it because I've had a lot of the biggest gut punches in the series spoiled for me. Like, probably the two biggest things that happen outside of a, fl- of a flashback I had spoiled for me, and they still impacted me very deeply. But we don't have to talk about that yet because I don't think any of those moments are really coming up for... Uh, the beginning, what's your impression of this first Yeah, I thought he ate his foot, so I'm not sure how you... <laughs> well, I, hey, stuff in a flashback doesn't count. I'm, I'm going to tell... This is a spoiler I can tell you um, straight up. Every time you see that black or gray border cart start to come in behind the panel, everybody who you don't know is alive in the future is probably going to be dead at the end of the flashback. So Romance Dawn, Luffy is a kid. He is friends with a pirate says he wants to be a pirate, accidentally steals a devil fruit, which you find out are these magical fruit that when you eat them, you lose the ability to swim, but gain some sort of superpower. A local bandit to punish uh, the pirate kidnaps Luffy, and in his effort to save him, the pirate loses his arm. That's romanced on. What were your thoughts there? How much did it bring you in? What, what were you thinking going into the very beginning of this series? I think he did a really stunning job in the very beginning. The artwork in it is pretty basic pretty laid out it's very open in comparison to later on i mean mm-hmm. there were some moments like when he does his little talks in between his panels in between the stories mm-hmm. uh where he talks about how stupid is it how do you pronounce is it luffy 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 yeah luffy where he says luffy is probably the biggest idiot there he names people uh he ranks people by their (laughs) intelligence and he says Mm. that luffy's an idiot and there's this moment right away in the beginning when he's a young kid where he decides to stab himself in the face to prove his how tough he is and make people take him seriously and the idea of someone stabbing themselves in the face so that others will take them seriously i was like what the hell am i getting into here (laughs) um and then as we go through the story, I kept I keep looking at that scar on his face. Mm-hmm. And it reminds me when he's making decisions later on, then I'm like, who would choose to do that? And then I see his stupid face with the scar under his eye. And I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> he would. He would choose to do that. I mean, he is the same kid who actually stuck a dagger into his head to prove <laughs> his toughness. Um, so I kind of love that continuation of that piece going through. And I was thinking that, it's an interesting decision to make a physical mark on your character like right away that has to stay with them in the drawing from that point on and helps mm. to tell you who they are. So I kind of went back to that first that's, part in Romance I've, Dawn. I've never heard that observation before. And I think that's a lot of, because a lot of people watch the anime first and the anime thought it was too violent to show a kid stabbing themselves in the eye. So they oh, cut I wonder it. why. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they didn't, want, I guess, want to be impressionable. But I've never heard that observation before, and I think that's so, especially with Oda's commentary, that's, that is really true, that it kind of just keeps in mind whenever you look at Luffy that he's an absolute dumbass. Yeah, it really does. And so when he makes decisions that you as a reader are like, no, no one would make that decision, that's absolutely freaking insane. 
And then you're like, no, actually, that's totally within his character, given mm -hmm. that, like, within the first, I'm just going to look. Oh, okay. Within the first two pages, he stabs <laughs> himself in the face. Like, you, it, the author is telling you almost immediately, you know, be prepared for this character to do, like, shit that just makes zero sense. And this is a person who's going to react on emotion, and you're going to see wild stuff as a result. I that's that's a really cool observation. I I think you also immediately see though what an asset Luffy being as fucking brain dead as he is uh is immediately cuz right after Romance Dawn uh the introductory chapter he shows up with Kobe uh this kid who wants to be a marine talks about how great being a pirate is. Kobe's like, "Yeah, I hear there's this dangerous uh swordsman chained up in this town. He's a real monster." And Luffy's like, "A, a dangerous swordsman fucking rad." Jumps into the prison complex, goes up to the man who's being crucified and is like, "Hey, what I got to do to get you on a boat?" I and a smarter character would ask too many questions to do that. It's why I love Luffy and why I think he's a perfect protagonist is because he's enough of a dumbass to move the plot forwards. The way that they have his number one asset being his tenacity. Like mm. it doesn't matter what else happens. It doesn't matter what his odds are. It doesn't, nothing matters. He'll just keep coming at it again and again, even if the odds are ridiculous and there's no way he should do anything like that. His tenacity is the most important thing. I, I think there's something like thematic in his power being uh, rubber in that Luffy's greatest asset is that he always bounces back. Yeah, so I love that. I got to say, just before we move on from the very beginning, uh, mm -hmm. the hat. Like, I want, I want a damn straw hat just like that now so bad, <laughs> which is a really sad assessment of my either my consumer needs or how I'm influenced because... That hat is so emotionally charged, mm -hmm. and uh, and and when you see what's the name of the pirate that he loves that he's uh, trying to be like Red Hair Shanks. Red Hair Shanks. We're gonna do that a lot. You're gonna be retelling me names. Oh, oh no, a hundred percent. I I this there are at this point I think like fourteen hundred named characters in this series, and I remember at least half of them. Holy uh, shit! Yeah. So Red Hair Shanks, when you see him in that hat and it seems like this iconic piece of him, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's like Michael Jackson's one glove. Uh, <laughs> and ironically, we see someone later on who becomes like Michael Jackson. Um, oh my God, he's actually based off of Michael Jackson, the character you're talking about. Uh, oh, 100%. There's no way he's not. Yeah. And so when you see that hat and then he gives it to Luffy, it... It's already so touching. I was like, if that hat dies, the hat got a hole in it that got sewn up. And I was yep. like choked. I was like, whoa, man, don't touch the I, hat. That's what comes next after uh, Romance Song. Although I think we should, to finish up Romance Song before we move there, uh, Zoro's introduction. That's where Luffy gains his first crewmate, Roranoa Zoro. I uh, love that character. Some of me wants Luffy to be my favorite character, but in actuality, I think that it is uh, Zoro. This early on, it's so hard to know what you're going to feel as it goes, because, like, the series changes a lot. It's huge, obviously, but, like, I feel like you you are going to keep loving Zoro, though. Uh, he seems like the type of character. But I hope he doesn't do anything that makes me hate him. I would be so pissed off if he made me do things that hate him, because right now, with his backstory and mm -hmm. with that and with the awesome piece with him and the uh, sensei's daughter, when he's Kuina, when yeah. he's like, what was her name? Kuina. You really remember everything. Yeah, so when he's having the conversation and she says, you're so lucky that you get to be a boy and that you get to have the opportunity to be the greatest swordsman in the world. I'm never going to have that opportunity. And he's all angry at her for saying that. He's saying, you know, you beat me consistently. And she says, and then one day you're going to grow up and have the muscle to be able to do this and this, and I'll never get that chance. Then they kill her. Yep. They freaking kill Girl her. Girl fell down some stairs. <laughs> and I was, and some stairs. Like yeah. we see Luffy tossed everywhere. Giant sea creatures ram into. Sure his Luffy's feet. made of rubber. Kuina, I not made of rubber. But they killed this poor girl by falling down. What an unceremonious ending to this like phenomenal swordsman. I was just like, oh my god, I, we killed her on the stairs. I also think it's so brutal. I think genuinely important for Zoro's backstory how unceremonious her death is. Like, That's, how I think it absolutely is because suddenly yeah. he's like, I don't care if I die because 
death seems like such a commonplace, easy death thing to Death can just occur. happen for no reason. Exactly. I can't let death get in the way of me accomplishing what I promised to her. Exactly. That's, that stays part of his character forever. Which uh, is why I think that, that that whole scene in Peace was a phenomenal introduction to him. So I'm going to be pissed if that I, dude turns out to go in a direction I don't like. There are characters that will do things that will make you like them less uh, in the Straw Hats. 100% that's true. I genuinely think if you like the aspects of Zoro that you're talking about there, the fact that he's pissed when someone says uh, that someone's innate qualities is what's going to make them win, the fact that death will not stop him from accomplishing his dream, the fact that he is going to give everything no matter what it takes to win, those aspects never leave Zoro. If, if you love those... You, I don't think, are going to have a problem with this character. I like, I love Zolo. Okay, what's the name of the little angry kid who ends up going into the service? The Marines? Uh, that is Kobe. Right, Kobe. Okay, I think, flash forwarding, that Kobe is going to come against them at some point, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, given, given that they said somewhere within one of the panels, and I can't find it, that they did make one mistake that day. They left something behind that was a problem. They said some little thing, and I was like, oh, no. Oh, I didn't so, remember that. I hope the gut punch isn't something to do with Kobe. I was like, that would... I, I cannot confirm or deny anything about Kobe. No, you can't say anything to me about anything, but I was thinking, like, ah, oh, if they... If they have a murdering of that poor little sucker. Hey, also, hey, manga readers know, but uh, I can't say anything. Then we go off to find Nami. Now... I, I like the way that we're grabbing characters here because it almost feels like the author is like, I could slowly introduce characters to you or almost like he was making a decision where he's like, yeah, I want there to be a crew and I want to bring in a bunch of new people, but I don't know mm -hmm. how to do it. And how am I going to do all these meet cutes? Right. And he's trying yeah. to come up with all these ways. And instead he decides to take a person who would stab himself in the face and just yeah. say that this person would pick who they wanted wouldn't take no for an answer because their number one skill is tenacity. <laughs> and then they would just be like, you, you're going to be the person. And the person is like, um, I hunt pirates for a living. And he's like, that is a temporary thing that we'll get around. We'll, and we'll figure that out. Don't you worry. Don't I even mean, worry about it. Literally I'm, the I'm first two now. people he brings on his pirate crew are people hunting pirates for bounties. And by pirates. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next one, Nami, who Luffy's only robbed Luffy's pirates. So Nami feels like she's like, what, the Robin Hood of the the world. In Just a so weird... we don't get corrections, uh, the, the pronunciation that the anime goes with is Nami. Nami, okay. Mm -hmm. So then we meet Nami. Be a and lot of that, don't worry. I like her. I'm a little skeezed out how in the different panels, how, how many people want to know her measurements and... <laughs> talk about how hot she is i am yep. a little skeezed by that that's um, it's japanese media and it's just part of the territory but i think that i think that her introduction and how they decided to have her um luffy was picked up by a giant bird and yep. and flown to a freaking town where he ends up meeting her and i was like that that's how you've decided to do it you've decided to make zolo have to person up and make the decision to be a teammate because and that's kind of mm -hmm. what i was thinking about in that in that whole section because zolo could have at this point been like yeah i guess uh that kid will find his way he seems to be fine he's made of rubber he'll literally bounce back but instead he gets all pressed about the fact that a giant bird has stolen luffy and follows him as fast as he can to go and rescue him and i thought that that was a really cool way of pressing the point that whether zolo knew it or not they were already a team. Oh, I hadn't even thought about that, but that's so accurate. Like he immediately is rowing as hard as he can to get to Orange Town to save his this guy who basically abducted him and was like, "Hey, I'm your captain now." Yeah, literally in the last part, Luffy is like, "NBD, I'm your captain. I know that you used to hunt pirates. Now you are a pirate." And suddenly, within a chapter, he has him rowing as hard as he can to rescue him. It's and I thought. That was a really great way of of him creating a quick bond that let us all know that it was too late. Whether Zolo knew it or not, they were already besties. I, God, yeah. Oh, there's so many little observations you're having that I definitely missed. I think part of it because the first time I interacted with the series, I was 16 and not quite as uh, media literate and savvy. But it, it is a really great way to very quickly introduce the idea that 
they are a crew already. Whether or not Zoro's going to admit it, uh, they have to be. Because, look, you went to save your captain. You didn't go, well, I guess, he's, uh, guess this is done. Bye. Yeah, 100%. And this is a person with a, a reputation around the world because he runs into a group of people from another, from the Pirate's Buggy the Clown. Mm-hmm. And at that point, he could have just been, he starts talking to them, they find out who he is, and they literally snap into shape and start rowing for him. So this yeah. isn't, this is a person with a, reputation that precedes him and now he is in a crew of two i'll i'll say his reputation isn't around the world it is uh very strong in the east blue the the sea that they're from all right regardless still a pretty yeah. a pretty good reputation to be in oh, a yeah. crew of two on a rowboat oh absolutely so when we go into chapter nine the femme fatale and we mm-hmm. are in buggy the clown's domain I loved this timeline. I loved this whole, the, all of these chapters around Buggy the Clown. I really do too. I think it's, the series starts to feel like, like a lot stronger with Buggy. Like being introduced, yeah. one of the big reasons is just being introduced to what devil fruits are like as, as a bad guy. Like a bad guy with devil fruit powers providing yeah. this like really unique challenge is really cool. It, Buggy is also like kind of menacing uh, in, in Orange Town. He's not just kind of menacing. He reminds me of the clown from It. But in a, if you took the clown from It and made him a pirate, mm-hmm. um, but then he became even creepier in one of the panels that he uses in between chapters where he said that if you take his hat off, he has uh, two weird shaped <laughs> hair things coming out, and that's what's sticking out of the side of his hat, his ponytails. <laughs> yeah, those are, those are actually ponytails, not tassels. Way grosser. Way, way grosser. Somehow made his character more hideous. But then, <laughs> I had no idea that all the panels in between each of the chapters that had Buggy, which I've got to admit, I've paid tertiary attention to. And oh. then you made a passing comment to me that those become important and they actually have some of the plot and people who hadn't been reading the mm-hmm. manga this way we're actually losing out on some of the plot yeah. because all those things that i thought were just it was chapter 11 of buggy after the such and such fight and i was mm-hmm. like why are we drawing these like why do these matter and then you were like oh yeah they actually become part of the plot and are important and i was like mm-hmm. oh shit i gotta tell you i love the idea of taking a villain making him terrifying getting him to do some of the storytelling around um the devil fruit and letting us know what happens when somebody has devil fruit and is evil, like you were saying earlier, Mm -hmm. but then literally cutting him down to size. And Oh my God. I hadn't thought about the fact that it's basically a fucking pun. (laughs) It's a pun of cutting him down to size. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It might not be, but that was my opinion. Literally cutting him down to size and turning him into something that is now amusing. So he amuses yeah. like a clown. So instead of being the scary clown, he becomes kind of the amusing court jester of the piece. <laughs> I do love that. That's great to think about. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that before. Of like Buggy kind of has a transition in that moment from the two clown archetypes from A hundred percent. Yeah. From the scary horror villain to suddenly uh actual clown, just comedic. Yeah, totally comedic side story and i just love that now i gotta tell you uh-huh. <laughs> chapter 12 dog i love this dog so much I want so this many dog. people have such an affection for this dog oh my god this dog's amazing and the way he drew him there's something about how simple and straightforward this freaking dog is staring you into the soul when well, panel two is the dog staring down the line and um, the Moji, the lion tamer, is coming up to him, and the lion is walking up, and the dog just sits there, unmoved, cuts all over his little face. And I was like, God dang it, I'm in love with this dog. <laughs> I I think he's so perfect for that part of the story too, because what you were talking about of Luffy's hat being so meaningful. Uh, oh God, what is the dog's name? It's like Shushu or something. I think so. Um, um, it's Choo Choo. Choo Choo's Chow is the Choo-choo. name of the story. Yeah, it's Choo Choo. Uh, so Choo Choo, I think, is so perfect for the thematics. And Oda is a great thematic storyteller. It's something that I think you're going to notice a lot is yeah. how strong he is with themes. 
and the theme of like treasure being whatever is treasure to you is so important in one piece and luffy's hat being a treasure is so important and like just a stupid closed down pet shop with a bit of dog food in it being something that Choo Choo will die for is so thematically fitting and makes Luffy understanding him. Like, it, it first of all shows off that while Luffy's a dumbass, his emotional intelligence is his pretty emotion. incredible. Okay. Yeah. He knows what people are feeling, what they need, what motivates them so goddamn well and can yeah. intuit what people what people need from him in, impeccably. Yeah. Uh, he sees this dog fighting for its life to protect this uh, a dog food store to just yeah. protect a piece of its owner and he knows no this is valuable to you i understand i'm like that too this is a dumb straw hat but it's everything to me yeah and so there's that moment where his owner goes off his his owner goes off to the hospital because he wasn't feeling well and he dies mm -hmm. and this dog just says well that's fine my entire life is sitting here and doing the last thing that my owner asked me to do and to be in charge and protect this shop and I dying doesn't matter so it's the same as all the other characters in that mm. he really has this theme of death doesn't matter that death is secondary and a hundred percent that death I is secondary to living up to your honor which is really a shogun thing and so I feel like he's created all these little shoguns so something very interesting is I think it's less honor I think it's more it, with with one piece it's more about about drive ambition and will like but it's but it's what you treasure mm -hmm. so it yeah. isn't honor is what I'm saying it's yeah. that it's a different thing instead of the the it's not like in the Tokugawa Bufuku. It's not this idea that that um, it's honor. It's more like it's what you treasure, that you yeah. protect the things that matter in your life even over your own life. Yeah, that the, the things you have decided are valuable are, yeah. are more valuable than you yourself. Protecting yeah. them, accomplishing your goals, whatever it is. Yeah. What you value goes beyond death. I, the themes around death in One Piece are very, very strong, and it continues a lot. The idea that, like, death isn't the absolute thing. It's not the be-all, end-all. It's not the end of a person, uh, because the things they care about matter more than just a person's physical body. That's why I was really glad you told me, because in the beginning, and he said a little bit less later on in the chapters, and I'm sure it's going to go mm. all the way through, and he really wants to hammer it out in the beginning, the idea of treasure. But in the beginning, he he comes at the concept of treasure, and I hope I'm not getting too highbrow on it. He comes mm. at this idea of treasure from so many different perspectives, so that you get a really round idea of what treasure means. And now later, I'm supposing, when he uses the word treasure in like chapter 600, he doesn't have to explain all the layered ways in mm. which treasure is seen because he's built it into his story. And treasure now takes on a whole new meaning. He gives it more meaning than it used to have by showing story after story, a dog protecting the store because it's all he had left of his master. A person who's fighting and refuses to lose a single other fight because of the memory of a person that they are fighting for. Like all these different ways build the idea of treasure into something beyond what it was. I think you're a hundred percent correct there. Uh, it, it is something as the series goes on that doesn't need to be said, but it is, it is just a given that treasure does not need to mean gold and gems and jewels, that it is yeah. something more ephemeral. This chapter was, I think, my favorite. And not just because Buggy goes through a transition. I know. I yeah. And I didn't know no, that's my favorite until I started to talk about it. So it's not just my favorite because Buggy goes through a transition. It's my favorite because the character of the townspeople and the mayor and them understanding um, their understanding of treasure and the dog and the way they look at treasure for the dog and then they do the straw hat in this one. So in this one, I think they really establish the idea of what each of us holds dear and what is the most important to us so that as he moved forward in the story, it was all there. And because of it, I think it became a super powerful chapter that also made me understand 
how much he treasures this. And then I started treasuring the story more because of it. So That's I think really it was a beautiful, really interesting, subtle way of getting the reader to have a commitment to the story because of the commitment everyone else felt to it. That's that's a very beautiful way of looking at it that I haven't really thought of. I I love that section too. I think uh, we'll get to what my favorite part of this section is later because it's much dumber because I do like shonen battle anime. A lot of the most common favorite bits from this stretch would definitely be from the Baratier arc, um, the final one of this stretch. But I, I feel you there. I think uh, Choo Choo is really brilliant thematic writing and is necessary for setting up this series where it needs to go. Absolutely. I, I 100% agree with you. I also think like when I coach, I'm a practice coach, not a game day coach. I mean, I do my game days, but I don't mm. love them the same way a lot of coaches do. But that's what this felt like. This was practice. We were getting to see all the in behind the scenes stuff, whereas the arc you were talking about, that's a game day. Yeah. I, I agree. I think Baratier feels like the first arc that's kind of the promise of what One Piece is going to be. Of yeah. like, there will be big bad guys, there will be a dramatic backstory. But like, Orange Town really sets up the themes for, for what's ahead. The idea of protecting your treasure, the idea of your life being less important than what you've decided matters to you. Uh, all of that's established and it's so integral to what One Piece is, what this story is about and trying to tell us. Yeah, I agree. So then we go to strange creatures. Pig line, bunny snake. Oh, I forgot that that whole bit with Gaimon. Yeah, that's a it's a weird little detour that I always weird forget little isn't detour anime filler. Dude inside of a treasure box. This was a strange ass chapter, and I wanted to ask you, but I don't know if you want to tell me. Uh -huh. Do we do we revisit these weirdos? The yeah. literal only way they've been revisited so far is that little buggy's big adventure and has buggy go back to go to there himself okay i saw that in one of the pieces that the buggy goes back and has like weird little animals and he seemed to have been in this area uh-huh but this was a strange decision it's, as i was looking at it i was like why did you decide weird. on this everything about it's weird a lot of people look at this a uh, little bit and like try to come up with reasons why it's like some sort of thematic foreshadowing about the one piece or whatever if it is, it has yet to come to fruition. Wouldn't that be interesting if it, in the end it is? I, if it is, it's most likely just in a thematic way, something about like a treasure that was under everyone's noses that they didn't know was there. I don't think it's likely, I don't think it's at all even possible that the One Piece is going to be there, but some sort of thematic foreshadowing I could see. There's another scene much later in the series that I think is a much better contender for thematically representative of the one piece but i could see it so far yeah i can tell you it doesn't come back because i've forgotten many times that this exists and that every once in a while i remember like oh right that's not anime filler i think the reason that i kind of like it is it's just like when you're reading a book and yeah. it's the reason that i hate so i oh, wait, hate the book the road because he never takes even a moment to let the um reader breathe you feel non-stop like everything is threatening and for a ton of people they love that style but there's a whole bunch of people like me who feel like by not breathing it takes away the impact of bad things when they happen because they start to seem so commonplace but i think this chapter here did a couple of things it let you know that there could be really weird weird things because these animals are like a snake rabbit and stuff like yeah. that so Strange things can come up and you just need to get over it. We've already we've already put it into the story so you know they happen. Deal and with then, the fact that this is weird. It can deal with the fact it's odd. We told you where we were going and it's on and then the other thing that I thought was good about this is that it let you show uh, a map of the region and talk about where the True. um where they needed to go um and let us see the whole area and it just let us all have a little quick breath. So mm -hmm. they were able to do things like show you the red line, the grand line, the different stages of where everything is, talk to somebody who had knowledge, and then just take a, a little step back and let you breathe. Having moments where things feel okay and you can breathe is something Oda is very, very good at. And I'm I glad to hear that. Specifics about that next update, we're going to reach a part where I can talk a little bit more about like what that looks like once you've seen it a bit. The Dread Captain, is it Usopp? Usopp. Usopp. Yeah. Yeah. This whole this 
whole um yeah line with Usopp is not my favorite. I love Usopp as a character. I think he's wonderful. Yeah. Syrup Village is truly one of the only parts of One Piece that I think I don't like. Oh, you don't even like it. I I think there are parts that I like. It is it is my least favorite section in the manga, I would say. I think it would be helpful just to say a tiny little bit of what happens in a in an area. So yeah. there's yeah, Usopp. He is a liar. Every morning he does a boy who cries wolf, and except for he cries pirates and runs yeah. around a town. And he's uh, named after okay. Aesop of Aesop's Fables, which is why he's 100%. a boy who cries wolf. Yeah. And then he runs around telling everyone pirates are on their way. Um, and then he uses his lies for good with a girl who is very ill. And he tells her funny things that makes her laugh. Mm -hmm. And he has a little pirate crew of little boys who adore him, despite the fact that he's him. Um, who despite follow the fact that he's him is so brutal. I love that. Sorry, but in That's this so good storyline, he's the freaking worst. Like I, I see that he could go places, but I'm not going there yet. Right now, he sucks. So then, <laughs> that's a very common take this early on. So then, the little boys follow him. And uh, he ends up helping to save the town from actual pirates. Uh, nobody believes him. Shocking, shockingly, no one believes him when he cries pirate. But then, Crazy, uh, <laughs> and then there is what is it? Plahador the butler is helping out this girl who's sick that Usopp comes and tells funny lies to. It turns out that um, Plahador the butler is actually. An evil pirate. Captain who is Kudo, which is just Japanese for black. So he's just Captain Black. Who is trying to get her to sign away her millions of dollars to him. Yeah, I thought that this whole series just kind of dragged. Yeah. And yeah, no, I do agree. I felt like I was on the beach watching them fight for like a decade. And and it's not like the fight on Baratier where it's it goes on, but like different things are happening and the status quo is constantly changing. Like, There's also different people fighting and different yeah. people at it and different people leave. I gotta tell you, this one was just more of the same. Plus it was all very predictable plot lines. Like like you were saying, like Usopp was uh, an obvious fable that already existed with the boy who cried wolf. Yep. The trope of the butler did it was the butler did it. It was like every trope was real. I'll say there's a lot of bits that I love and most of what I like is comedy. I think comedically there's a lot of funny shit like um, them going to the wrong beach. Luffy being like, how did I not get to the north? I ran in a coldish direction. <laughs> uh, Zoro getting trapped okay. because of Usopp's not oil slick. Fine. I did love that. Yeah, I ran in... How did I not go north? I ran in a coldish direction. It's so fucking dumb. It's great. Is it pronounced Django? It is Django. And Django is absolutely just based off of Michael Jackson. People thought he might be based off of Steven Tyler, but then hundreds of what? chapters later, a character based off of Steven Tyler showed up who is very clearly based off of Steven Tyler. You would have to be drunk and um, have a head injury. To not see that this is Michael Jackson. Oh, there was one thing I did like in the whole chapter. They went back in time and told us who Usopp's dad was. And yeah. then him being one of the original pirates from the Red-Headed Pirate crew that Luffy had grown up with. And that Luffy had cool moments with his dad that this kid never got to have. And then Luffy got to tell him, your dad talked about you. And I just thought that was a really cool flashback tying things together so that this person suddenly had a deeper meaning than just being a rando they chose for the crew. And so it was that same idea as the one where you have uh, Zoro rowing as hard as he can to save Luffy right away so that you know that they have a relationship. It's that exact same thing. It creates a faster bond in a relationship and now you're like, uh, damn it, I have to like this guy? You're gonna want to like Usopp at some point. Everybody has a point where they start to want to like Usopp. But it, I just, I hate his face. We're heading to the Baratier because I think we're done with your village, right? We both agree. Yeah. It's it's genuinely like when, when I talked to you, I think it was last night or the night before, and uh, you said where you were, I was like, just bear with it. This is literally my least favorite part of the entire series. I 
both loved and hated this arc. Ooh, let's get into that because I it's one of my favorites. It yeah, I hate a in the East Blue. As, other than the next one, it's my favorite. Yeah, I other than the next one. Oh yeah, no, the next one's by far my favorite one, in East Blue. Yeah. It, sorry, look, I'm not not spoiler set up too many expectations. The next one is everyone's favorite arc in the Ace Blue. I have not met someone who it's not their favorite arc. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. a lot of pressure. Look, there's no pressure because it's just you're going to like it the best. I bro, you don't know that. I do know that. I've never I have literally not met a person who has not felt that way. Wow. I have met zero people who it isn't their favorite part of the East Blue saga. I have met people who it's their favorite part of the whole series, and they're wrong, but I've met them. In my in my favorite narrative up to this point, what was your favorite chapter? Chapter 11? Oh, boy. Um, no. So, okay, okay. I can't remember chapter names. I have the manga right here. Let me see if I can find it. My favorite moment in this section is so dumb. I fucking love when Don Krieg is like, I'm the smartest, you can't get me. And Luffy's coming up to punch him and he turns his cape inside out and it's got spikes suddenly. And Luffy punches the goddamn spikes. I think at this point in the story, what Oda's trying to convey is Luffy is a big fish in a small pond. And we just haven't seen just how small this fucking pond is until, this mo until the Baratier. And you see it with Mihawk casually destroying the most feared pirate in this sea because don craig is the biggest baddest dude from the east blue and mihawk easily outdoes him but the thing that okay. lets you know that luffy's a global player that he's going big that he's not limited to the power of the of the east blue is when he punches the goddamn spike cape and is just like bitch that's not going to work i i'm not playing your game yeah i'm i'm luffy and i'm stupid yeah <laughs> so look i I'm, just do things <laughs> I'm and far too hashtag built different to put up with this. I think I love that idea that you said, and this is why I think it's a good idea to do things where you're having like a book club and why mm -hmm. it's really, really helpful because the way that you just described it as being like, we just discover in this arc um, how small the pond is that they've been in. I mm -hmm. didn't see it that way, but as soon as you've said it, because if I'm going to be honest, who's my mm -hmm. favorite person in this entire thing so far, it's Hawkeye. Oh yeah, he's cool as fuck. He's the, he's a major player. He's he's Mihawk, major leagues. The greatest thing ever. He there are people still debating if he's the literal ceiling of the power in One Piece. There are many people who believe he is as strong as they get still where we're at now. Yeah, I think and that's totally possible. And the I can see why people would think that. He might be the coolest character I've ever seen created. He's so fucking badass. The fact that he looks at Zoro and is like I just need this. Pulls out a goddamn dagger. Yes. The only thing I need to fight you. And then he takes out like something that looks like he could clean his fingernails with it. And he's like, you fight with all three of your swords, little one. I'm going to use this. And then the fact that the reason he doesn't kill Zoro is because he has the guts to let himself be struck down. Yes. Like, lets him live because he shows enough guts. He's like, oh, you know what? Maybe you will grow into being an actual challenge for me one day. I won't fucking end you. Hey, um, just for people out there, if, uh, if anyone's watching this and they want to comment or chat uh, and you disagree with me and think I'm overhyping Arlong Park by saying it's everyone's favorite, it just is. If, if you disagree, tell me honestly what East Blue Arc is better than Arlong Park. And you have to say why. You can't just be a contrarian. Give me a goddamn reason because you are lying. <laughs> So basically what you said is, hey, feel free to have a conversation with me, but know that you're wrong preemptively. You are wrong. You, I swear <laughs> to God, you are lying. If you, I if hope you I say that Arlong Park's not your favorite East Blue saga, I have you never I seen someone. I hope I read it and I hate it. <laughs> I go for it. Try your best. Try to hate Arlong Park. I fucking dare you. I'm good to try. Okay, this part was my favorite in See, this whole thing. See, that's what I'm thing. saying, Greener. What, Greener? That's what I'm saying. Can you disagree just to be a contrarian? No, because you would just be being a contrarian and you admit it. All right, what was your favorite part? My name is Dracul Mihawk. It's too soon for you to die. Discover yourself. See the world and grow strong, Zoro. However long it may take, I shall await you at the top. That moment God, there. Yes. And then he goes, strive to surpass me, Rorano Ro Zolo. And I was like, okay, that was epic. That was a super epic moment. It was my favorite yep. in that entire arc. I was yeah, like, no, damn. It, 
Zoro has such a habit of stealing arcs of just like something else is happening and Zoro will just do something so badass. You're like, sure, everybody else's thing was cool, but did you see what Zoro did? Exactly. And that's what it felt. And But in this one, when Mihawk screams at him as he's sailing away, like, clearly I'm not going to stay here any longer. I am way too good. Yeah. I am way out of everyone's league. And then he says, I will await you at the top. That one, I was like, mic drop. And it's then he just sails off into the sunset. It's Zoro's moment with Shanks. It's his equivalent of Luffy with Shanks of 100%. meet me when you become a great pirate. This is his equivalent of it. 100%. But Mihawk just showing up. So when I first watched it, um, I found myself thinking, oh God, is Zoro going to accomplish his dream this early in the series? And we're going to have him just yes. hanging along as the best. And I had so yes. much dread that that's what was going to happen. And him getting the absolute shit kicked out of him handily. Yes, but also, were you also equally worried when that first started to happen that he was going to have to do a give up trope where mm -hmm. people were going to have to talk him back into finding his hope? Yep. I was I was worried about about both of that. The it happened perfectly. It's perfect exactly. to set up Zoro as a character and to make him as awesome as he needs to be. There were some things about this arc that I loved. I loved the idea of Prep Geezer putting a restaurant in the middle of the ocean because he himself had been starving in the middle of the ocean. Yes. Like a restaurant where if anyone shows up, no matter what, starving at sea, no one should die that way. Yeah, like, no one leaves without some sustenance. So um, I think... That was awesome. Oh, God. I really do love Sanji. Sanji's a character who I will say, you're in for a tumultuous relationship with. There's you can tell right away. Like, yeah, that, this is not a dude who's going to have a straight line. You can tell as soon oh, as you meet him. A hundred percent. You know he's not just going to be a perfect guy who you love yeah. forever. No, they're not going to be like, here's an easy to love dude. They're like, hey, you want to love these dude with the weird twisted circle eyebrows? He has some aspects of him that are so lawfully good, but it's just his own virtues that are lawfully good. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. He's, so yeah, he, exactly. He's sticking so much to the things that he believes in at the cost of what others would consider good. Like him and exactly. Seth feeding, feeding Don Krieg made fucking everything worse for everyone. Oh, 100%. But they will not let someone starve at sea. It is something exactly. they will not let happen. I mean, it's, it's not as clear now, but it's the same with his virtues around women where Sanji won't hit a woman. Hey, believe it or not, not always a smart choice. It comes down to his fighting style. He would be so much better at fighting if he used his hands. Think about how much skill of a knife that man has in the kitchen. And he refuses um, to because a chef yeah. never uses his hands for anything but cooking. Yeah. He can't sully his hands with bloodshed. He has so many things that hold him back to live yeah. virtuously in his virtues. And it's it's something you can criticize him for, but it's, it is also admirable. And it's something I love about him as a character. I hate free pirate second unit commander, the Invincible Pearl. <laughs> I, okay, there is a woman I follow on Twitter who I followed, I love her art, I've studied it a lot to try to learn from her, and she, for whatever reason, has the hots for Pearl, and I cannot understand it. No. <laughs> yeah. No! It's not her favorite One Piece character, but he's up there somehow. Uh, dude, he's just, I just hate he's him. He's awful, he's wretched, yeah, I dislike Pearl a lot. His wimpity wimp thing when he gets a little boo boo owie on his nose that he loses his crap because he'd never had a little boo boo owie before. Uh huh. Just ugh. And then, and then the I didn't like the choice at all to give him the ability to light himself on fire when things get bad. Yeah. So he made it so that the pearl when as a as a, that is a weird a thing. I've never really thought about event, that critically. Was because he grew up in the jungle with wild beasts, and when he senses danger, he makes flames. I was like, no, it doesn't. I, for me, it doesn't feel genuine because a, um, why is a thing called the pearl, which is totally after an oyster catching fire? I've got terrible news for you. What? No, he doesn't come back, does he? No, no, pearl. Wildly enough, as much as almost everything in One Piece comes back, uh, Pearl doesn't. Pearl's gone. God. Uh, no, the terrible news is uh, fire happening for dubious reasons is a One Piece staple, and it's not going away. Oh, why in an oyster? 
Why on a pearl <laughs> thing? All right, that's fair. An oyster being fire themed doesn't make a lot of thematic so sense. Stupid. He's stuck between two weird shell things, so he protects himself with his metaphorical shell. And then yeah. A, you have this doofus catch fire, which I'm like, really? You, you've got this sea creature dude catching fire? And then B, he grew up in the jungle with wild beasts? Why is a metaphorical oyster growing up in a jungle? <laughs> Never thought about that one before. I hate the pearl. I hate him. Ooh, <laughs> so, so is the reason this arc is mixed for you because of pearl exclusively? Um, ooh. That's a great question. I do hate him a lot. It feels like a lot of the negative opinions on the Baratier arc are coming down to Pearl. I think it's also so important. So this is something I think is less significant in the world you're coming from with literature. So you're used to a world of literature where power levels are a little bit less abject and straight out. Uh, where like, sure, the more powerful wizard in the fantasy series can't lose usually to the less powerful wizard. But if someone has a clever trick or gets the jump on someone, they can basically accomplish things in most fantasy despite strength. Whereas in battle manga, which One Piece is at the end of the day, strength matters a lot. Power levels matter a lot. Power scaling matters a lot. Not even 10% of the way through. And it shows you the ceiling of power. It shows you one of the world's strongest people going, not necessarily all out, but showing an example of what they're capable of. And because of that, the power scaling of One Piece feels contained and like it's not going to spiral into insanity where someone's punching apart mountains or firing energy blasts that destroy the world. That's not going to happen because we've seen a promise of what the top looks like. And I think it affects so much of One Piece to have been introduced to the ceiling of power this early. So you think he is the ceiling of power? I don't think he's necessarily the strongest, but I think he's so near the top that uh, like, it's still showing you what the top of the world looks like. Or he's the strongest in his particular field. Yeah, because he is he's the world's greatest swordsman in theory, so he should be better yeah. than anyone else who fights with the sword. Although that is a hotly contested subject for reasons that might become more apparent as we go on. In the okay, well, I was going to say a couple of things. Uh, okay. I don't take up all the time, but the first thing I was going to say is I should always do one prediction minimum every time I leave. Oh, because, 100%. You're right. That's a great idea. Because I know nothing. So mm -hmm. I think predicting based off what's there will amuse those who have already read it. Um, 100%. You should do a and prediction. Then, um, the other thing I was going to say is we forgot to talk about that woman. We don't have to. I didn't like her at all. The, Alvita? The bad guy woman. Iron Club Alvita. I mean, I feel yep. like she's literally just there to have someone for Luffy to punch when he comes out of the barrel. I agree. hundred percent. I felt like uh, her character was nothing but a stop point, but I just yeah. wanted to mention her in case anyone was like, I don't think there's anyone who cares enough about Iron Mace Alvita or Iron Club Alvita, however it's translated. I really to, like not. put up a stink. I, she's, I don't hate her. I think her design is cool. I like the, I, I like her big club, but also like, there's, there's nothing to the character at this point. It's just someone who's there. I didn't to punch. find that she was necessary. So my predictions are um, that Nami is going to cause a master cata uh, major catastrophe for them. Okay. She's going to be a real problem. I think she's going to steal a treasure that's going to get them in a heap of trouble. Okay. Um, that the little whiny military kid who's been left behind is going to become a... A uh, person who tracks hunts them down, and they're going to be pitted against each other. Okay, and the manga uh, readers know about Kobe. Uh, and he's gone. I think that Sanji is going to be forced to reckon with his uh, code, and he is going to have to go back on his own code. All right, uh, those are locked in predictions for the series. I will not tell you any of those, but we have a record of them for when you're caught up for you to look back on and see how you did. One last thing. One um, more prediction. That Buggy is going to end up at the line with them. All right. Um, and then I think that eventually, he, for some reason, he and Buggy are going to become friends. If someone can write those down in the Drock Show Notes channel, we will have them for posterity. And I'm excited for you to look at them and see how you did. And then my top characters. Well, um, let's do a top five. Let's let's say your five current top characters. 
despite the fact that he's in for five seconds, Hawkeye, number one. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Man's pretty cool. Yeah. Straight to the top of the charts. Um, number two. Uh, it's still Zola. It's still Zara. Fair. Zara's cool as shit. That's fair. Uh, I love him. I think he's fantastic. Excellent character development on that. Number three is Luffy. Okay. Um, fair. Weirdly, Luffy's Luffy's, Luffy is three and one for me at the same time, but he's three. <laughs> it's it's tough to rank a main character because the series is so dependent on who he is. Yeah, that's the thing. But I'm still number three is is Luffy. Uh, number four is Sanji. Okay. And number five is Buggy. Buggy, that's fair. I do love Buggy as a villain. I think he's great. Usopp is so far to the bottom right now. Usopp doesn't even know there's a sun. <laughs> so what am I reading next? Next, we are going to read up to chapter 100, which is the end of what I would consider. And this is going to sound fucked because I just said the number 100. What I would consider the end of the prologue. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, uh, that's the start of the series proper, when the crew uh, advances to the next part of their journey. I don't uh, know what I just got myself into. You got yourself into uh, nearly 1,100 chapters. I absolutely love this art. And that that line there, you had the same dream as me, was was a really special moment, because when you're thinking about all the treasures and the idea of treasuring a dream... Yeah. Um, to find somebody who holds the same dream as you in one piece means that you found somebody who has the same treasure. Oh my God, that's beautiful. And I hadn't thought about that. And the symbolism that that line is said at a moment where they're sitting with a pile of useless treasure. treasure useless treasure. To them. That absolutely and, does nothing. And that despite the fact that they're, they're in a situation where treasure is useless, they're sitting next to it. What they should treasure is food, but Zeph put food below a shared dream and pushing exactly. someone forward who can accomplish what he wished to. Oh my God. I've never thought about how thematically brilliant that moment is before, but yeah. it really is. And it was just so powerful. So yeah, I love what you've done with this. So I'm reading up to a hundred and I'll find something. This is a perfect uh, picture for that moment. Thank Love you. it. I thought the idea here is this is the all blue. So we have a bunch of fun sea monsters from throughout One Piece history. I appreciate you adding to that <laughs> that part, that idea that they both shared the dream to go to this one place and yeah. together they're looking at that dream off in the sunset. Yeah, like it's, the they idea. can see the common vision whether we see it or not. Really, really eager to what see does What does Laboon mean? Don't worry about Laboon. You ain't got to worry about Laboon yet. Oh. Not knowing things that are coming up and it it would be like walking into Star Wars and and having somebody who's slowly going through it and then everyone else being like, hee hee <laughs> So I think it's funny that people have so much knowledge and I'm just sitting here with my limited perspective. I, I mean, my absolute favorite read through I've seen of One Piece has been by Murphy Napier. Uh, Napier, 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 I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Uh, but she's a book YouTuber who read One Piece, and she was in the same boat. She loved making predictions, many, most of which were wrong. Uh, and she was like, oh, it feels so weird that everyone knows everything, and I'm uh, going into this blind. And it is so many people's favorite reaction they've seen to going through One Piece, because it's so cool to see an entirely unique perspective of someone who doesn't come from the world of manga and what they can add to it. I think you've already given observations that I haven't seen someone make before about the thematic writing that I've that's honestly added depth to the series for me and I think people are really going to appreciate that oh I appreciate that okay well okay. I'll talk to you soon we'll set up our next interview yeah. I've had a lot of fun uh, me too this is amazing and next time we will talk about chapter 69 to chapter 100 the end of the East Blue Saga apparently the greatest chapters ever the best parts of the East Blue Oak. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be a liar and tell you it's the best it ever gets. It's just the best of the East Blue Oak. I'm glad everybody could be here. This is so much fun. I'm excited to go through the entire series. I really love doing this. And until next time, it's been lovely to welcome to you. Okay, like his face is almost Elvis Presley like. Yeah. Just his face. And 
I have to say that people are weird about Elvis Presley. They're unable. I, actually, I'm going back and taking a look at him. You almost wonder if he's designed after I've Elvis. I've never thought about that before, but it might be.